<clears throat> okay, so hello to everybody and welcome to the UFMG uh, Constitutionalism and Democracy Seminar Series. We are back after two months long break. I am Tim Madrinozzi, visiting professor. <laughs> so I'm Tim Madrinozzi, visiting professor at the Federal University of Minas Gerais. The seminars are an initiative of the graduate program in law of Federal University of Minas Gerais and the Digital Const UFMG Content Governance Research with the support of the UFMG Study Center on Trans Transitional Justice, the UFMG GNET Research Group, the UFMG Center on Transnational and Comparative Juridical Studies, the ICONES uh, Chapter Brazil, the graduate program in law of the Federal University of the semi -arid. Uh, Brazil, the Graduate Program in Law of the Federal University of Uberlandia, Brazil, the University of Brasilia, Brazil, and the Brazilian Association of Political Philosophy and Constitutional Law, uh, obviously in Brazil. Um, so although the results of the presidential elections in the uh, United States indicated a point of constitutional resilience, the worldwide trend on democratic and constitutional erosion is still in place Against this background, the seminar series on constitutionalism and democracy aimed to create an online forum for of uh, topical vivid and interactive academic debate. This series uh, of events provide opportunity for, for distinguished emerging and early career scholars to discuss the main concerns and challenges affecting the current constitutional jurisdictions around the world from the perspective of comparative constitutional analysis. We have already discussed the future of constitutional changes with Richard Albert and Giuliano Benvindo, ab abusive constitutional borrowing with Rosalind Dixon, uh, David Landau, and Mia uh, Fersteg. I talked about the liberal constitutionalism as a research project with Giuliana Alvi. We had a session about uh, why the party is over with Kim Lane Shapley and, and Neida Sargado. Heinz Klug and Berihun uh, Gebeya discussed constitutional democracy and accountability, political parties and constitutional accountability in post-apartheid South Africa. And then we returned uh, to South America to discuss the Chilean constituent process with uh, uh, Jorge uh, Pontesi and uh, Johanna Frölli. Uh, we also had a special edition of this seminar series in which we had the pleasure to have Antonia Baradja, Mark Graber, and Tom Ginsberg with us, who share their views about our books, uh, uh, Emilio's uh, book on constitutional erosion in Brazil, and the one I co-authored with Agnieszka uh, Kavian Katsala about the liberal constitutionalism in Poland and Hungary. And today, we have the honor to host as a keynote speaker, Professor Graina de Burka from uh, NYU, who is also uh, the co-editor of the uh, Oxford University Press Book Series, Oxford Studies in European Law, and co-author of the textbook EU Law. Professor De Burka is uh, co-editor-in-chief of uh, the journal ICON and serves uh, on the editorial boards of the European Law Journal and the American Journal of International Law. She is a corresponding fellow of the British Academy. To act as a discussant in this panel, we are pleased to welcome Professor Erin Delaney from Northwestern University. She was named the uh, 2022 Federal Scholar in Residence at Europe uh, uh, Research Institute for Comparative Federalism in Bolzano, Italy. And she has previously had the Fulbright Visiting Research Chair in the Theory and Practice of Constitutionalism and Federalism at McGill University. She has also uh, had research fellowship at Edinburgh University and Université Libre de Brussels. Uh, the format of this event today is the following. Uh, first, our keynote speaker talks about constitutionalism, democracy, and the European Union. I believe it's special regard to, to Hungary and Poland for more or less 30 minutes. Our discussant has uh, 20 minutes for sharing her views and comments. After that, we will have a Q&A session in which the audience can make comments and ask questions. Please, for this, use the chat function. Um, I would like to thank our team, Lisa, Anna, Luisa, Bruno, and Natasha for helping us in, the, in organizing uh, uh, these uh, seminar series. Uh, the videos of the seminar series are uh, already available on YouTube, and we are recording this panel too. If you disagree with that, please turn off your camera. Uh, Professor and Delaney, thank you very much again for accepting uh, this invitation. I also would like to welcome the audience. Thanks for joining us today. 
Uh, Professor De Burka, I'm uh, looking forward to your presentation, especially in light of the recent developments concerning the relationship of the EU law and domestic, that is Polish and Hungarian law, which is still a serious issue, even if it is today when we are facing the Russian aggression and war in Ukraine, might not be our biggest concern. So I'm wondering if you could also share your views on how this war could affect our values, international and supranational order, and the cat and mouse game, or as we call it, pushing the limits game, the Polish and Hungarian government usually plays with the EU. Uh, thank you again. Uh, the virtual floor is yours. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks for the invitation. Um, thanks to Aaron for agreeing to uh, to be the discussant um and i should should i should i stop if you've stopped recording sorry You're, yes please i'm sorry yeah. i don't no worries. know so what is happening bruno something happens on uh, anna is not here let me see if i can record it yes they heard you mention the war in Ukraine and the bots attacked. <laughs> I think. Recording I think. in progress, so maybe we can. Yeah, continue. Yeah. Thank you, and sorry. I'm going to tell you. her. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so, uh, thank you for the invitation um, and to Aaron for being willing to read and discuss the paper. Uh, the, the paper I'm presenting and the topic is, um, as you mentioned, uh, why the EU has not more robustly confronted uh, Poland and Hungary, um, who remain EU member states with virtually all of their privileges intact, um, even in the face of a really uh, significant and serious attack on the values that are declared in EU law to be fundamental and foundational, and that is in particular um, the values of uh, democracy, human rights, and the rule of law. Um, and uh, Timea, you asked me to reflect, to, you, you suggested that maybe uh, it's hard for us to focus on these issues now when there's war taking place um, within Europe, <laughs> at the edge of the EU. Um, but I think these things are, are very related. I think uh, the attitude of states to rising liberalism uh, and to these frontal challenges to values uh, such as including democracy, self-government, human rights and the rule of law are, are very related, even if um, uh, we are now fundamentally focused on something much more immediate and much more visibly threatening to life and security. Um, but the uh, the events of um, the last 10 years or more in Poland and Hungary uh, are, are somewhere on a spectrum um, in terms of the turn away uh, from democracy towards um, uh, illiberalism. Um, so uh, let, let me um, explain briefly what the, the paper is about and then I'll try and present the main points. Um, so the question is, is that I'm asking, it's a kind of a think piece, I suppose, is why Poland and Hungary's membership of the EU has remained largely, not entirely of course, but largely unaffected by their widespread serious and documented um, attacks <laughs> on the rule of law, democracy and human rights, their actions which have severely undermined um, these in many respects. Um, so, you know, I, I initially would say that uh, one, one response uh, some might have is you're quite single out these two states. There are many EU member states uh, that have various types of rule of law problems. There are also many EU member states that constantly violate provisions of EU law. They've all been brought before the Court of Justice multiple times for violations of law and so on. Um, Poland isn't the only uh, state whose constitutional court has challenged the supremacy of EU law and so on. Is this um, are, we, are we pegging them out in some way, singling them out? But the reason they're being singled out is because what they're doing is very frontly challenging, not just laws and policies of the EU, many states do that, but really these um, uh, values, which now are said in the EU treaty to be core values on which the EU is founded, um, requirements of the rule of law, democracy and human rights, um, which are said to be 
conditions for membership of the EU. You can't join the EU until you show that you have instituted and practiced adequate respect for these values. And there's a sanctions clause um, which allows states which are seriously violating these values um, to have their uh, rights suspended. Um, so uh, the point is that Poland and Hungary um, through a whole array of actions over the last decade or more have been gradually with increasing kind of confidence and full frontal um, openness been uh, undermining um, these uh, values. Um, so the question is, well, why is it that um, the EU's political institutions in particular, and I make a distinction in the paper between the political institutions of the EU and most particularly the institutions that are intergovernmental, the Council of Ministers, um, the European Council, which, which represent the states, um, uh, why they haven't really challenged or robustly confronted Poland and Hungary. The supranational institutions, as I'll outline, have taken various actions, but um, that sets in train, as, as you mentioned, a cat and mouse game where these two governments are well capable and have shown themselves well capable of dancing around the different um, enforcement actions that have been brought or attempted to be brought by the EU supranational actors. And by that, I mean mainly the Commission, as it's called in the European Court of Justice, but to some extent, the European Parliament too. Um, so, you know, one point I wanted to make early on is that we say these are foundational values of the EU, but they um, weren't always listed as such. So when the EU was founded as the European Economic Community, there was no reference to rights, no reference to democracy conditions, no reference to the requirement that a state would have to be a democracy in order to apply. There was probably an possibly, you know, an implicit assumption that states applying to join the EU should be um, democracies, but it wasn't really articulated until the 1970s um, when uh, Spain under Franco was interested in uh, at least having a, uh, an economic association with the EC. And so the question began to be raised. But really, you know, the, the what are called the Copenhagen conditionality criteria, the criteria that a member uh, state of the EU in order to apply for membership and to be admitted would have to comply with um, human rights, democracy, and the rule of law, whatever the, the content of those principles uh, was deemed to be, that the conditionality criteria were soft political criteria from some time in the 1970s onwards, mid 1970s, but really weren't formalized uh, and were not made a condition in the treaties until the late 1990s. So th that means that actually nowadays we say these are the core values of the EU, but it took a long time for them to be made explicit, then for them to move beyond being political values to having legal status and then eventually treaty status. Uh, and so one question might be, and I'll just put it out there and come back to it, is are they, maybe they're not so foundational after all, maybe they're not so fundamental to the EU after all, maybe that's window dressing and maybe the, you know, the EU's really its fundamental values are market integration. Um, so, uh, you know, I'm just raising that Point and I'll come back to it again at the end. I don't really subscribe to that view myself, but sometimes uh, there's cause to wonder how committed the states are to enforcing the, the supposed fundamental values of the EU alongside the market values of the EU um, and, and how prepared they are to, to back up their supposed uh, commitment to these with real enforcement. Um, so you know, the first thing to say, and I, and I won't spend much time on this because it's been really very well documented by others, but both Poland and Hungary have really significantly um, violated all kinds of aspects of uh, the rule of law and um, human rights over uh, the last decade or so in ways that really fundamentally undermine the, the character and quality of their uh, liberal democratic systems, formerly liberal democratic systems. So both states retain characteristics of majoritarian electoral democracies, but the ruling parties in each of the countries over the years have really consolidated their power and undermined many core elements of their liberal democratic political system as it was before uh, these ruling parties came into power and have moved the countries much closer to the authoritarian end of the political spectrum. 
So many of these are well known. They've subjected the courts to political control. They reduced the retirement ages of existing judges and replaced them with government friendly um, appointees. They appointed government friendly figures to many other independent institutions like the public prosecutor. They established disciplinary procedures and used them uh, to discipline judges, to either discipline them or even terminate their appointment if they questioned aspects of the government's agenda, or um, more recently, if they referred cases to the European Court of Justice on, for example, the independence, their own independence or the independence of their uh, fellow courts in, in that country, um, or sometimes on other topics to which the government objected, like asylum law in Hungary, um, uh, judges have been uh, disciplined for referring cases on such issues to the Court of Justice. Um, other things they've done, they've controlled media freedom, dismantled media pluralism. Um, they have repressed civil society groups, defunded them. Uh, that was particularly obvious in, in Hungary, but also um, in Poland to some extent. They've smeared and harassed critics through multiple civil and criminal defamation actions. Um, and they've seized equipment of investigative journalists without warrant so that they're repressing freedom of expression. Um, certain disfavored groups and minorities have been the subject of repressive measures, LGBTQ plus communities in particular, asylum seekers, the anti-migrant rhetoric has been escalated. These are more human rights violations than rule of law violations, but they're altogether, these, these sets of violations amount to really significant um, undermining of the foundational values of the EU, or at least the listed foundational values. They've also used um, uh, the apparatus of law and order, you know, the public prosecution offices, in a very selective way, once they had governmental control over those offices, to protect ruling elites, you know, not investigating prominent cases of corruption, but using police powers and powers of prosecution to discipline and to harass political opponents instead. And there's also been use of COVID as an opportunity to introduce very wide executive powers and to use uh, emergency powers and avoid scrutiny of, of government. So this whole array, and there are many more, but the, the practices have been well documented by many independent observers, both from outside and inside the states. The Council of Europe's Venice Commission being, you know, really reputable and um, a uh, very authoritative institution with representatives from over 60 states composed of constitutional experts from around the world from courts and parliaments and civil services has constantly expressed its concern about the undermining of the Polish judiciary. Um, also the European Commission has brought numerous infringement proceedings. Many civil society groups have um, documented and, and you know, uh, gathered evidence of the multiple uh, violations being committed in both states and the ways in which their laws and practices have undermined democracy. Um, Hungary is, you know, or Viktor Orban has claimed that Hungary is an illiberal democracy and there's a debate about is that an oxymoron and so on, um, but Hungary is much closer to being an elective autocracy in the sense that elections take place and so on and we'll see what the elections are like in, in um, April, but you know, many of the important preconditions in a democratic system for fair and free elections, like a free pluralistic media, freedom of association for civil society groups, the absence of government interference with the electoral system and so on have been um, really undermined. Um, so there's an electoral component of democracy, but even that uh, has been weakened and the party in power uh, quashes and punishes civil society and political opposition expels or controls independent institutions, silences critical voices and funnels money towards loyalists. So um, it will be very interesting to see what happens, whether the united opposition in April can defeat the um, Fidesz party in Hungary, but it has become very difficult uh, for any opposing party to win in, in an election there for the reasons that I mentioned. Um, and in Poland, there is a greater freedom of association and civic space, but um, the public media are increasingly under governmental control um, and there's been a systematic undermining of judicial independence and Poland uh, is considered to have fallen to being a, a semi-consolidated democracy under the Freedom House rankings, while they treat Hungary as no longer being democratic. So um, these, you know, uh, challenges to the rule of law and to human rights and democracy are well uh, documented. So then we think, well, what's been the consequence of that So uh, for their EU membership? Because I began by saying it's a condition of membership of the EU um, that 
the, the candidate states should comply with these values. So neither Hungary nor Poland would qualify for membership at present. But is their membership affected? Well, um, the first point, I won't go into detail about this, but um, there isn't an explicit power of expulsion um, from the EU. So that's the simple answer to why uh, there hasn't been any attempt to expel Poland or Hungary um, is that there isn't an expulsion mechanism. There was a consideration of including one at the time the EU was drafting what was then called a constitutional treaty, it later became the Lisbon Treaty, but they decided only to include a power of suspension. Um, some others have said, but it can't be the case that an international organization like the EU cannot ever expel a member state, no matter how rogue it goes, no matter what it does, there must be at least an implicit, you know, international law uh, power to use the material breach conventions of the Vienna Convention, the law of treaties and so on. Others say, well, the EU is very different. Uh, it has deliberately avoided, um, you know, departed from public international on that respect. And there is no power to compel a member state to leave. Even the European Court of Justice has said this. Um, however, you know, last year, I think the Dutch prime minister, when Poland and Hungary tried to adopt, uh, sorry, tried to block the adoption of the EU's budget and the pandemic relief fund, uh, raised the issue of, well, could they establish an alternative EU organization without those two member states? So a kind of a drastic alternative to not being able to expel them. Um, so in other words, politically, you know, people are contemplating there must be a way to, to rid ourselves of states if they really turn fundamentally against what the organization is about. But the EU has formally left itself without that power of expulsion. But apart from the power of expulsion, there are other ways in which you know, member states um, in the position of Poland and Hungary might be confronted. And, you know, the point I want to make really is that there has been great political reluctance to confront them. Um, some people say, well, well they're, they're, what, what could be done? And, you know, it's really for the commission and for the court and so on. But, uh, you know, that isn't really the case. There, there are many political um, opportunities to uh, confront um, the two member states in question to make clear that their actions are unacceptable politically are violating core conditions of membership and that there will be serious political consequences. But the main avenue that most people know of the Article 7 sanction procedure that would lead ultimately to suspending the voting rights of these states um, has been disabled in a way by the fact that the ultimate step in that process requires unanimity. And of course, except for the state that's being the procedures brought against, but there are two member states in this case, so each will protect the other. So the assumption is, even if you got to the end of that procedure, um, one or other state would uh, protect the other. But that, that seems not to be a good reason, though, for not pushing through with the steps of the process, the sanctions process that can be adopted. So it took a very long time, but eventually the first step to trigger Article 7 was taken. But in neither case was it taken by the political institutions of the EU, the Council of Ministers, which has the power to do it, but never did it. Um, instead, the Commission eventually triggered Article 7 against Poland. The European Parliament eventually um, triggered the uh, procedure against Hungary. Um, in each case, knowing that it wouldn't, you know, they, they would mutually veto uh, the censure procedure against each other. But still, um, those the Parliament and the Commission clearly thought it's really important to try to, to at least use the first steps of the sanction procedure. But the Council of Ministers has stopped it there. They could take a majority vote to move to the next step, but they haven't done so. They have these discussions and the discussions are apparently pointless and don't lead anywhere and nothing happens. And another discussion is then scheduled for later and so on. And, and Poland and Hungary are very good at, as we mentioned, the legal cat and mouse game. Um, so nothing has happened. So. The, the member states within the Council of Ministers are not willing to, to, the, to kind of move on with the political theatre of Article 7 and say, we find you have seriously um, and, and, and sort of uh, fundamentally um, uh, violated or introduced a risk to the values on which the EU is, is founded. But, so that's one kind of robust political confrontation that's been avoided. The other um, that, that uh, until recently had been avoided was funding conditionality. And so most people will, may have heard of the fact that you know, very recently, as recently as last year, eventually um, a provision was introduced, a regulation was introduced 
to adopt a conditionality mechanism for EU funding, which would be um, triggered uh, in relation to rule of law um, uh, violations. So there are other forms of funding conditionality that have long existed in the EU, macroeconomic conditionality being the main one. Um, but, but And again, it goes back to that issue of what are the true values of the EU? Is it macroeconomic stability or is it democracy and the rule of law? Um, because there's a strong conditionality mechanism for one, but not for the other. So eventually in 2020, a rule of law conditionality mechanism uh, was adopted. So we, might say, so we might say, well, why am I saying then that the states are not willing to? Well, there are two reasons why this is a weaker measure, late, first of all, and secondly, weaker than one, than, um, one would want. Um, the regulation itself is limited in scope because it, it links rule of law conditionality firmly to the overall financial interests of the EU. So it's not any uh, rule of law a violation, but only one that affects the financial interests of the EU. So it's been uh, limited in that way. Um, and then it was further limited in, in a more temporary way when uh, Poland and Hungary threatened to veto it, um, at least not to veto it because it could have been adopted without them by majority, but to veto the pandemic relief funding, new generation funding that was being adopted at the same time. And they blackmailed, in other words, um, the, the rest of the EU. So the heads of state and government in the council at the time said, OK, um, they reached a compromise saying that they would, um, the, before the rule of law conditionality um, regulation could be applied against any member state, first, the commission would have to adopt guidelines on it. And secondly, those guidelines shouldn't be drawn up by the commission until after the Court of Justice would rule on an action for annulment of the regulation if Poland and Hungary wanted to bring it. So it's a very strange, totally unprecedented intervention by the European Council to soften and delay the activation of this new uh, conditionality regulation, which already had some limits to it, but now was being halted in order to get Poland and Hungary to agree um, to, the, to the new generation funding. So, so, those, so those are two ways, and, and there was great outcry at that. Why did the European Council give in like that, violating the rule of law itself by, by interfering with the legislative process and tying the Commission's hands and promising nothing would happen until after um, a, a case could be brought to the, to the Court of Justice. There are other smaller examples, and I gave one in the paper of how the, the member states refused to confront or would yield to um, Poland or Hungary um, when Viktor Orban opposed the nomination of Franz Timmermans uh, to be commission president. And Timmermans had been a very robust um, confronter of the member states on the rule of law, uh, was not intimidated by them and willing to challenge them. And so they uh, refused to support his nomination and the rest of the states decided, okay, well then we won't put him forward, we'll instead, uh, and they eventually put forward van der Leyen. So, um, there is a reluctance, a political reluctance to challenge uh, Poland and Hungary. There's a soft stepping around them. There's an avoidance of confrontation. Um, there's a sitting back and letting others um, do whatever needs to be done. Um, some states have come out a little more. Some are more, I mentioned Mark Rutte, the Dutch prime minister. Some states have started to show support for the commission. A few of the government legal representatives show up to court actions brought by the commission against Poland or against Hungary and provide support. They don't bring the cases themselves, but they come and appear to support them. Um, but uh, there's a reluctance on the part of the, the uh, member states alone or together um, to, to express a clear condemnation and opposition to what they're, they're doing. So on the other hand, there is plenty of supranational confrontation, as I put it. The commission has brought multiple actions against Poland, against Hungary, um, for lots of different dimensions of what they've done. Uh, the interference with the independence of the judiciary being the main one in relation to Poland, a little also in relation to Hungary, but in relation to Hungary also the cracking down on civil society, on the media, um, independence and so on, on refugee issues. Um, and the court has found for the commission in all of these cases, you know, so um, lots of infringement proceedings. Although some people have criticized the commission for not acting enough against Hungary in relation to many different aspects of judicial independence that it's focused more on Poland and sort of gave up on, on Hungary, but it has acted on other 
um, issues. And there are also lots of what are called preliminary reference coming from national courts that, you know, they go to the Court of Justice and the Court of Justice has also been very strong on those. Um, the court has imposed penalties on Poland for failing to comply with orders of the court um, in relation to the judicial disciplinary mechanism. And most recently, the one most people will have heard of a couple of weeks ago, the court um, eventually upheld the validity of that new rule of law conditionality regulation in the challenge brought by Poland and Hungary. Um, so, you know, the court has been relatively robust. Uh, the commission has done quite a lot belatedly, but eventually did. And the European Parliament has issued multiple condemnations, but doesn't have the same power other than this political statement um, as, as the court and the commission. But uh, Poland and Hungary have been very active, very creative in blocking and delaying and challenging, watering down these various um, actions um, and, and coming up with defenses and sometimes doing it, you know, using legalistic measures, sometimes very, being very aggressive and hostile and coming out with really um, <clears throat> unpleasant, insulting kind of uh, calling the EU, um, um, comparing it to the Nazi occupation or to the Soviet Union um, and so on, but mostly through these clever legal cat and mouse games and through different tactical retreats. And like at the moment, um, uh, there's something going on with a, a kind of a supposed tactical retreat by Poland after the rule of law um, conditionality um, ruling. So what I really wanted to ask, I suppose, having laid out the situation, really fundamental undermining of, of the EU's values, supranational willingness to confront them, political and, and intergovernmental institutions unwillingness to confront them. Why? Um, given how openly they've um, been violating these values. And, um, you know, they would, the first explanation I already suggested earlier was, well, is it then that, that really, you know, these values are really just virtue signaling in the treaty? They're not a genuine statement of the values fundamental to the EU. The member states are willing to kind of turn a blind eye um, in a way that they weren't willing with, you know, uh, economic and, and macroeconomic issues like with Greece during the Euro crisis, those are fundamental. Those are, uh, you know, seen as contagious, but not these, um, not illiberalism. Um, that's something that they can just pretend isn't happening. Um, and so those values are not really fundamental. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'll put that out there, but I don't, really believe that in the sense that I think most states are concerned, the other member states are concerned about the slide into um, authoritarianism and liberalism in these member states, but that they're still not willing to confront them for a number of reasons. Um, they're, they uh, do want to express and declare and, and emblazon these values, but the, the core point I think is that they don't want uh, any monitoring, any real monitoring of those values. They don't want the EU to be involved in serious, ongoing, uh, close monitoring of compliance with human rights, democracy, and the rule of law in the EU. So why is that, or what, what are the reasons? Well, the first is just the typical reluctance of states within an international organization to sanction each other. You know, in the I often mention this to students, in the European Convention on Human Rights System, there are thousands, hundreds of thousands of individual complaints, very few, relatively speaking, interstate enforcement cases, just a few, but they're usually in the case of something like what's happening at the moment in Europe, you know, armed conflict, really significant imposition by one state on, on the human rights of the population of another state. But mostly this kind of deference, um, sort of reciprocal deference, it's been called self-preservation by states, not confronting each other, but sort of treating membership is like a club membership where you don't really confront your fellow club members. Um, so that would be the first uh, possible reason. It's a dangerous one, I think, but that's the reason. Second possible reason is that, you know, that the states don't really believe that tough confrontation will resolve the problem and that, that it might even escalate the situation or increase domestic support for these governments. Um, and, and their hope is probably that they'll eventually be de defeated by just their own electoral mechanisms, like the uniting of the Hungarian opposition against Orban. So it's a calculus that let's wait it out, let's not alienate things, let's just wait and see if things work themselves out domestically, um, because it might work if we confront them. Um, 
So, you know, the fear, it's a fear of confrontation as being, you know, that it'll fail. Third possible reason, I'm less convinced by this too, would be the, the traumatic experience of Brexit that they, they want to avoid further fracturing or fragmenting the EU with, with other possible departures or you know, alienation of member states. So they're overlooking really fundamental problems in order to avoid further weakening of the EU, um, further fragmentation. And finally, well, um, the, the one that probably seems most um, worrying at the moment, but uh, another reason for avoiding suspension or tough political action is the fear of driving Hungary, obviously in particular, into the embrace of, um, of Russia, creating further geopolitical instability and security risks for the EU. Um, so none of these necessarily mean that the EU or its member states are indifferent to the democratic backsliding, but that they're willing to overlook it, uh, want to overlook it because it's kind of a calculated gamble that you know, the situation won't be improved by confronting them more um, by really robust confrontation, that it's better to treat them as normal member states and let the limited legal enforcement of the court and the commission do the work and, and that maybe in the long run that'll work. And I just want to, you know, finish with a few comments on, on why I think that it's a mistake, that um, I think the political unwillingness to confront uh, Hungary and Poland more robustly, even if there are reasons for it, is a mistake on the part of the Council of Ministers and the EU member states. And, you know, the first, uh, you know, I mentioned that, that there's this assumption that there aren't so many externalities or costs contagion, you know, for other member states. Most of the costs of an authoritarian system, they might think, are borne by that state's own population, you know, by parts of the population who don't support the authoritarian government. Um, and, um, you know, I would say that that's a, that's a mistake because there are significant costs and spillovers and risks for the EU itself um, of failing to turn, turn, you know, are failing to confront um, the, the, the attack on liberal democracy in Hungary and Poland. There are costs for the EU, I think. There are costs for the member states individually, and I'll say something about those, but there are also costs for the values themselves, for what they mean, for what human rights, democracy, and the rule of law actually mean in the, in the EU. Um, so, you know, the harm to the EU, well, the stature of the EU and the, its authority as a promoter of democracy and human rights, its ability to speak out against authoritarianism in other parts of the world is weakened significantly by the fact that two of its own members have become uh, autocratic. And this might go back also to the question you asked me about speaking out against Russia right now. Um, you know, does the, you know, the EU's distinctiveness as a regional organization had become bound up with being not just a wealthy economic bloc, but a liberal democratic bloc committed to human rights, democracy, and the rule of law, its policies of enlargement of neighborhood and so on are premised on uh, respecting human rights and democratic conditionality. And that is undermined. Um, the hypocrisy comes to light when there are member states within the EU with authoritarian or semi-authoritarian political systems. You know, how can EU negotiators insist with prospective candidates on the Copenhagen criteria if those criteria are not taken seriously within the EU, they're just looked away from. But in the second place, I, I was saying, I think um, the EU is also damaged in other ways by these, uh, you know, um, erosion of democratic standards. So um, we've seen a whole uh, array of national courts across the EU questioning the independence of the Polish judiciary in particular, refusing to use the European arrest warrant to send back suspects to those states. This is in the, in the Netherlands, in Germany, in Ireland, in Spain, amongst others. Um, they're questioning whether, the, you know, the, the kind of mutual trust that's supposed to exist between member states and that the single market relies on, that the European arrest warrant relies on. The judici you know, national judiciaries are more willing to question um, whether that is eroded now than, than their governments seem to be. Um, a, a slightly different example that I read in the newspapers recently was for a completely non-political case. Uh, a husband, and wife, an Irish man, was married to a Polish woman. They lived in Ireland. The marriage broke down and she fled the country, went back, took the children, went back to Poland. He brought custody proceedings and he won in the Polish courts. She was required to bring the children back to Ireland and to allow him access. But then suddenly the Minister for Justice, who's also the public prosecutor, intervened in the judicial proceedings, made an extraordinary complaint, brought the case up and had uh, the ruling changed in favour of the woman and her children. And the reporting of the case in Ireland drew attention 
to these concerns about the erosion of judicial independence in Poland, it isn't just it, that it affects people politically, it affects ordinary citizens, it affects the functioning of, you know, marriage laws and, you know, other kinds of um, everyday uh, ongoing uh, things in the, in the EU. The third way in which the EU could be harmed by turning away, pretending, you know, giving leeway to, to Poland and Hungary is that the EU institutions themselves are composed of representatives and nominees from all the states, including the uh, states which are increasingly reflecting authoritarian and illiberal values. And, you know, the, the nominees from these states, what happens if they begin to nominate candidates to the EU institutions that reflect those values rather than those uh, you know, the values of liberal democracy? And to give two recent examples, the Polish government nominated as its candidate to fill a vacancy at the European Court of Justice, um, uh, a, a candidate who had been a judge on the contested Polish Constitutional Tribunal, which had ruled at the government's request that the EU treaties were partly unconstitutional in Poland. So he's been nominated to the Court of Justice. Um, and secondly, uh, uh, the Hungarian Commissioner for Enlargement, uh, Oliver um, Barhelyi, I think, has been criticised a lot for compromising rule of law standards in some of the enlargement uh, negotiations. And the last point is that I think that there's as much chance by playing the long game that the EU's not confronting Hungary and Poland, waiting for authoritarianism to abate, that it'll actually spread rather than abate. Because these are not the only states in the EU where there are problems with the rule of law. Um, you know, Malta, Slovenia, Romania, and other member states, older, uh, long-standing member states, there are problems in all of these. And if it's clear to emerging illiberal forces and autocrats in other member states that no effective action is going to be taken by the EU against them, there's every incentive to continue and expand those actions. So I think the risk of non-confrontation uh, is, is at least as great as um, the risk of, con of confrontation, which the, the EU member states seem to currently fear. You know, that in failing to confront Hungary and Poland, the nature of the EU itself could gradually change with the breakdown of mutual trust, with the spread of authoritarianism in the EU institutions through these kinds of nominations and in other member states. And finally, the values themselves, the meanings given to democracy, the rule of law and human rights are being weakened and eroded by the failure to challenge um, authoritarian practice. Um, so I think I'm going to uh, end there. I've spoken probably for longer than I said I would, and I really look forward to hearing um, Aaron's comments. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, yes, yeah, so Erin, please. Great, thank you very much. Thank you, Tamea. Thank you to UFMG and all the other various organizers of this program. And thank you, as always, to Grania, from whom I have learned so much about EU law. It's an honor to be able to respond. Um, so uh, perhaps unsurprisingly, given the uh, given my background, I, um, I first of all want to agree with everything Grania said, but that wouldn't be a very exciting back and forth just to say that. So I'm going to agree, but then I'm going to ask her to um, engage with me in a paradigm shift and have a conversation, not about the EU as an international organization, but about the EU as a quasi-federalist constitutionalist entity and see if we end up in the same place. I think we almost do, but I think the remedy might be a little bit different. So as I take your remedy, Grania, it's directed at the leaders of the other member states. And I think my remedy might be directed at the people of the member states rather than at the leaders. Um, so let me propose this alternative way of looking at the problem and see and see where we end up. So if we think about the EU as a, let's call it a quasi-federalist constitutionalist entity, which is very, not very satisfying phrasing, um, it is one with aspirational values. So rather than debating whether or not the values are true, we just take them as a given, but we recognize they're aspirational. All right, and so then what do we think about a situation in which there would be in a federal system, subnational, or in this case, national, authoritarian enclaves? So Edward Gibson has done a lot of work on authoritarian enclaves and uh, uh, 
uh, Robert Waite Mickey has written about um, authoritarian enclaves in the United States, and Gibson's written about them in other places, Mexico, just the idea that in a federal system, you can end up with a subnational authoritarian enclave. And how you end up with that enclave happens in a couple of different ways. In the United States, right, uh, it's a authoritarianism born out of white supremacy in the South. So it's a different kind in some ways of authoritarianism than what we're talking about in Hungary and Poland, but, but, but no less illiberal at, <laughs> at many levels. Um, and so why does this happen? Well, one reason it happens in a federal system is because of federated political parties. So a national, a subnational leader gets a role at the federal level, but is insulated at the subnational level from any sort of attention to what's going on there through this federated party system. Well, that, that overlays with the European story and is further reinforced by a lack of common media and the fact that you don't have the sort of openness of media that would, that could uh, allow for light to be shown about what is happening at the different levels. So that's one sort of way in which this develops. Another way in which this develops, which also might be the solution, is when there aren't, there isn't an ability to um, engage in individual rights claims using your federal level rights document against your subnational state level action, right? So how does the charter apply? Does the charter apply? Why doesn't the charter apply to nation state action itself, right? So this is, the, this is part of the solution that the US Supreme Court develops in the 1960s to a doctor, doctrine called incorporation that allows the court to intercede between the individual and the state to develop more meaningful individual rights against the US state, not just the US federal government. So there could be both a weakness in political parties and the structure, weakness in human rights and the ability of human rights to function as a way to protect against these enclaves in Europe. Um, in the literature on federalism, one of the solutions or the areas in which there is available solution to this kind of enclave problem is actually the judiciary, because only the judiciary has the capacity to act independently of parties or of presidents or of, you know, political actors. So if you are looking at the EU through this lens, it's not surprising that it's the court that's left to do this work. And you don't have to go through the analysis of expulsion because you, you know, we're not going to expel, we're not going to expel Alabama from the United States. That's not part of the dynamic, but what do you, but still, what can you do about it? And when the leaders of the states are involved in the, you know, equivalent of the council, like a Senate, right? There's nothing that that Senate can do. So in the United States, story, the Senate is completely locked up and is unable to pass civil rights legislation because of the effective veto from the Southern states, the Southern Bloc. So again, nothing is changing, nothing is happening. Doesn't feel that different from the EU. Um, and then ultimately, the way in which courts can help is somewhat limited. So, you know, in the United States, the example is Brown versus Board of Education, famous desegregation case, but of course, almost as famous as Brown v. Board is Brown, Brown v. Board 2, which says you will desegregate with all deliberate speed. And of course, it doesn't happen very quickly. So, uh, so there's the limit on the court. This to me sort of parallels in interesting ways some of what Ha is happening in the EU. So then what, what is the solution or what is a solution to subnational authoritarian enclaves in the federal system? 
And one possible way of thinking about it um, is actually proposed by Guy Charles, who's a professor at Harvard, who's developing something that he calls the constitutional theory of shame. And that in a way is thinking of, you could think of it as sort of from sham to shame, right? What do you do when your constitutional aspirations don't match what is your reality on the ground? And how do you effectuate constitutional change through shame? And so his argument is sort of from experience that this happened in the United States through the national attention, through media attention, to Bull Connor and the spraying of fire hoses and the releasing of dogs on children on national TV during the efforts of the nonviolent protests in the civil rights era, right? These, these moments, Bloody Sunday on the bridge, these moments where national attention is, is focused or in the U context, it would be super national attention, is focused on these terrible, illiberal, violent actions, and that it is shaming to everyone to be a part of this story. And, and so, you know, he also references that it is useful to have the backdrop of the Cold War and that it's not only are we, you know, is the United States failing to live up to its ideals, but it's doing so in the context of international attention. So he sort of builds this idea of what might go into a operationalizing a constitutional theory of shame. He's still working on it. So I don't, he hasn't gotten further. And so I've been thinking about, well, how do you operationalize shame absent the kind of specific set of events that gives rise to his conception in the United States where, you know, it's, it's very, it's effective, right? It leads to the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act in 1965. What, are, what is the way to operationalize shame? And, and it seems like there are a few prongs to what this might be that pose challenges in the European Union context. One is a shared sense of the aspiration. And so maybe there's not enough of a shared sense of an aspiration to democracy, human rights, and the rule of law. That seems negative. I feel like there may be um, that there's that sort of shared sense. Uh, but how do you then kind of make it salient and who is doing the work of making the illiberal actions salient to populations around Europe in the Union in order to kind of effectuate shame and bring the pressure to bear on the political leaders. And in some ways, I feel like this goes back to the weaknesses of the EU as a federalist constitutionalist system, which is a democratic deficit, you know, the lack of these kind of um, interlacing, integrating elements of common media, of um, just sort of the kind of these these shared uh, aspects of a broader society that would allow for the shame mechanism to operate. But it it does feel like there's maybe something more to grab onto through that lens in terms of what should the next steps be than just sort of hoping that the leaders will understand their own hypocrisy or their own sense of shame and get them to act when it seems like at least from the you say it's they're unlikely to do it because they're in an international organization I say they're probably unlikely to do it if they're in a federal system anyway, either. And that what you need is mobilization and social change me mechanisms in order to kind of force the hand of the leadership. So maybe we both end up in the same place, but I thought it might be at least fun to think about it in terms of um, federalism and constitutionalism or theories of constitutional change as well as 
sort of the paradigmatic international organization lens. So now I've talked for too much and I will, I will hand it back to you. And thank you so much. It was really fascinating. And as you said, like Reina is what talking about like leaders, you are talking about like shaming, mobilization, social change. And I just would like to add whether it is not uh, like not only, but maybe we should have a look at the society, the people as well. And maybe we should ask the question whether the EU, the Western part uh, of the European Union uh, actually understands the people and the value system of the people in the Eastern part of the European Union, because now this value system seems to be like exploited by, by populist and autocratic leaders. And this might be the reason why illiberalism could emerge uh, in, in Hungary and Poland and could be actually maintained. And let us not forget that regardless of, of, of the manipulation with electoral law, uh, I mean, uh, the, in, in, in Hungary, Fidesz won three elections. And that, that, that should be a reason. And, and uh, uh, I... Um, what my like half understanding of the approach from from uh, the, the Western part of the European Union is that, or the European Union minus Poland and Hungary, I don't know how to put it. So uh, that they uh, they are like they using maybe this this word like patience, and they are they are kind of proud that they they show patience because patience would pay off on the long term, as Raina said. But as we could see, it it is not the case. It is just it just lets these uh, illiberal leaders to play the game even longer, and and that is why I, I I don't really believe that whatever action can 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 be done whatever they they are doing without like voters uh, you cannot do anything and and then it comes the question whether the voters want to change whether the political actors in the member states Hungary and Poland they are like good enough to, to change the mindset of the people or or get them out of this other reality which is created by peace and, and fidesz so thank you so much and now i i think i would like to ask Raina to to reflect on what erin just said thanks sure thank you very much really interesting um reflections erin um and and also uh Tamea, that uh you know so part of me is tempted to say erin um no, it is different. You know, it's a it's an international organization, and and there's a reason why actually they could do something because there's a provision for suspending. You know, you can't suspend Alabama. You could, and there's provision for the fact that you might need to suspend. You know, one of these states. Um, so, you know, it's contemplated that you know you're you're a provisional member of the club, a conditional member of the club, unlike a true constitutional system where you're you're part of it you're you're in the family and you can't be non-family even if you're behaving badly um but at the same time you're right that a lot of the issues are very similar in the structures the example of alabama is a good one um you know but then again you know again my my temptation is yeah but the reason you can't really do anything with alabama in the sense is because you can't do anything there is no um other kind of stick available and so on it has to be left to courts and so on um, but it's true that the disabling of those mechanisms in the EU has left the EU almost in the same situation where it can't do anything. And, you know, I thought your, your suggestion about shaming, of course, is a really good one. And, you know, people have tr been trying to do that in, in the EU, but it's so hard. And some of the reasons why, as you said, are this, you know, the lack of a European public space media, but it also relates to what Tamei was saying, which is that who who has to be shamed? Is it the people in the other member states to let them know, hey, you know, your governments are not seeing anything about these? Or is it the people in, as Tamei was suggesting, in uh, Hungary, in Poland, like, why are you repeatedly voting for these people when they tell you something, but they're doing I don't think you approve of everything they're doing. You know, let's look at what they're really doing and not just what they're saying and so on. Um, and that's the dilemma is to know, first of all. Um, Can I ask I think, a question? Sure. Is it, is it too late to shame the people in the Hungary? And I mean, how, how I guess the, how can we 
believe that there are free and fair elections through which people at this juncture are now really no. able to express dissatisfaction. Yeah, you know, I mean, is that is it possible to even uh, contemplate that now? Sorry, Arian. In, in what language do you want this shaming thing? In which language? Well, I think that I mean, that goes to to Grania's sort of question about who is to be shamed in the in the developing theory of constitutional shame. It's everyone else, right? So it's it's not the people within the liberal state that it's somehow their fault, you know, for having potentially been gaslit or have you know being in a situation now where there is the only way out is through potentially some kind of mass protest revolution, you know, if, if you're at that stage, right? I mean, um, the idea is to shame, to shame everyone else for allowing it to happen. So, I mean, you know, the, the thing is that I, I think I, I, Timé knows much more about Hungary than I do, but um, I think in Poland, you know, there's relatively, free, I mean, there's, there is sort of political, repression and media intervention and all that, but I think it's the electoral system is still reasonably functioning, you know, and, and even, I don't know about what you'd say about Hungary. I've read different things. It's very hard for me to assess from outside. Some people say it's really been interfered with others say, no, it still functions. You know, it's, it's sure there's tinker, there's tampering everywhere in every state, you know, in ways, but, um, but you know, that, actually people voted, they voted for, you know, um, PIS, they voted for Trump, they voted for PIS, they voted for um, uh, Fidesz and so on. However, there does come a point where then if people don't remain happy, as usually happens in democracies, is that eventually people get unhappy with the stuff, the lies the government's telling or whatever. If then it's becoming impossible to know what the lies are because they've controlled the media to know how to, you know, so so then it gets much harder, right? So that's what we'll find out, I suppose, in April is, is it still, you know, we, it's a mixture of do, do the people still want Fidesz or do the people, even if they don't want Fidesz, are they able to vote against him? Because is, is that going to be possible? And it's really hard to tell which is going on, you know, whether it's real support, full support. We like everything he's doing. So I was thinking about the shaming thing that, you know, it's one thing to show dogs on children and hoses and so on. It's another thing to say mm, the judges aren't independent. You know, you're 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 uh, penalizing this poor elite member of the judiciary. You know that kind of thing. It's it's like the value of the rule of law is one that lawyers understand. How do, how do we translate that into a sense of outrage? I mean, I thought it was really great to see judiciaries all over the EU going to march in Poland. You know, that was that was great. But again, it's not mass mobilization, right? It's elite mobilization. Um, how do you get people to care about the refugees that are being uh, pushed back in, in Hungary and Greece and everywhere else? You know, how do you get people to care about the others that have been othered by, um, by, by a liberal uh, and, and less than a liberal, you know, politicians and so on? So mobilizing shame is really hard. Um, and, you know, having a media, you know, unfortunately, in the end, even just mobilizing some truth about, you know, your government siphoning the money off, you know, that kind of thing, appealing to self-interest might even uh, be more, you know, functional. But sometimes I think the governments go too far. And when they do, that's that's good in a bad way. That's good, like in, in, in Poland, for example, with just going all the way on reproductive rights back to the dark ages, that brought people out into the streets, you know. Um, so it would have, you know, it has to be that kind of miscalculation that's almost equivalent to the dogs on the children um, that you need to get people mobilized. So that's the limits of mobilizing shame. I think that when we're talking about the human rights of, of unpopular minorities, or when we're talking about the rule of law of judiciaries that don't seem so important to people, it's, it's only the cases like the one I, I, that's why I gave the example in detail, even though it's a very minor thing in Ireland, the couple, the married couple, and this guy can't see his children anymore because the Polish, you know, Minister for Justice decided to intervene and turn over the case to protect his citizen, you know, even though 
she'd been found by a Polish court to be responsible for sharing custody and so on. So those things to say, hold on, you, you're living in a system with these people, uh, their, their judiciary is now captured. Um, do you care? You know, I mean, you make, that's the way to make Irish people care and say to the Irish government, got to do something about this, how to make the people in Poland care and to push back the people in Hungary care and to push back. These are, these are really tricky things because it needs a lot of truth <laughs> information and that's been controlled. It needs, you know, a sophisticated counter campaign, as you say, because the populist the liberals are very sophisticated and they're really good at this. Um, so I sort of feel like it needs to be on all these fronts. Um, you know, we, we you know, need to think of ways. I, I mean, one of my colleagues, some, some of you will know him, John Maureen, um, uh, who is the human rights commissioner in the Netherlands, does so much to try and generate this campaigns, bringing things to public light, trying to shame political figures, the, the parliamentarians in each state saying, do you know that your government is sitting alongside them and is not saying anything about what they're doing and so on. There are levers you can use. You can you can say no to lots of different votes and you know do, don't approve things. It's harder to see for me how to mobilize the kind of outrage that we'd need to to get people um, you know mobilized sufficiently. But sometimes there are like you know one of these governments can go too far and can actually hit at something that people really care about. Um, but they're really careful to hand out the goodies, you know, the welfare payments and so on, to keep people wanting to keep voting for them, where the the the, the, the liberal stuff is only hitting or hurting other groups, not and and the nice stuff, the welfare is keeping them happy, you know. So it's it's really tricky. Um, I guess that's why. I mean, I am a believer generally in mobilize the people that's the answer but because it's so hard in this case to figure out how to do it and in what ways that you know mobilizing the peer political pressure seems to me to be really important too to me maybe you can tell us more about the electoral system in hungary how free is it how hopeful can we be about the april uh, elections i i i think that uh everything what you uh what you want to say about Hungary or what you 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 hear about Hungary depends on on the person's how much the person can actually endure because of of the uh, demise of of constitutionalism. So I think that there are people who are just like uh, even at the first time they are saying that it's it's a dictatorship, it's authoritarian system, and there are others who try to to maybe uh, have a look at uh, the, the system and how it functions in a more maybe sophisticated manner. Uh, and, and it is very difficult to, uh, to actually measure where it ends, where, where the other system starts. So it is just individual perceptions, I think. And, and then we have the, the indices, and, and then you, you just mentioned the Freedom House, which says that we are hybrid regime, while the VDEM is saying that we are already an autocracy, I mean, Hungary, and, and all, 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 I mean, uh, and, uh, and uh, Poland is just like, uh, they, they are following us, but they, they're not where we are yet. And uh, so, and as for the electoral system, they, are, they are keep manipulating the, the electoral rules, and making it more difficult for for the uh, opposition to to actually win. Uh, and and now, um, uh, what you 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 can see? I mean, right now, I simply don't know because right now you don't know anything. I think uh, about uh, about uh, politically, uh, who who supports right now Fidesz and and what is going on today and and the next weeks maybe. Uh, but uh, what uh, when they, they, uh, the United um, uh, Opposition organized this uh, primary election during autumn, then they, the people get like mobilized, mobilized uh, a, a bit. And then, then uh, the uh, surveys showed that they get uh, more and more support. So there was a kind of hope. And after that, it, um, it simply like we had Christmas and I don't know what mm. happened, but nothing happened. And and now they are like um, head to head, so you, you you don't you don't know, and um, and even if they win, uh, they will have a very difficult situation. 
Yep. So, yeah, so that's it. The constitutional court doesn't help. <laughs> I mean, it helps to, to the government, uh, yeah. but it doesn't help to, to the actual fair uh, election and competitive election. Now, uh, they, they, they uh, discussed the case about the newest uh, rules, and then they said that uh, even if, if it, it uh, gives um, opportunity to to like cheat it doesn't mean that it is it, it will affect the fairness or or the, the free nature of the election so um, we don't we don't know uh, but maybe if if uh, if uh, uh, enough people is is mobilized and go to vote uh, they they might be able to win but for that people really need to to get themselves and and yeah. And and how you get um, how do you get people to care about stuff? What if they do just simply do not? What if, it, as you said, they are not really interested in? They get their allowances. Uh, they they are informed every month every month that uh, how much money they spend on the electricity bill, for instance. Uh, because that is one of the policy of the government. So what if what if they just don't care and 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 then as you said the the government is really careful so they they won't go too far they they will know what to do and they they, they will just simply not do what they are not supposed to because polls shows that it is unpopular that it's popular they don't care so you can do this so this is very with the liberals i think it's it's very um mm -hmm. difficult tricky which is why is. I think, you know, and, and people live comfortably in, you know, authoritarian states like Singapore and so on, where the standard of living is good, not if you're a migrant worker, but, you know, um, and you, you lose your political freedoms and you have these sort of sort of elections, you know, but it's, a, it's an authoritarian system. So, yeah, people can live. And, and if that's the case, you know, and if, if Hungary and if Poland goes in that direction, then you think it's for the EU to say, oh, is it okay then to have an authoritarian system? That's why I think in the end, it's that horizontal political decision has to be taken. Is that, is that okay then? So then the, you know, human rights, democracy, the rule of law are not actually, they're not fundamental values. Those are, they can be put to the side. What matters is in is a market, economic integration and other kinds of geopolitical issues. Um, and I guess that's what I'm trying to get at or yes. expose in the, in the paper. Yeah, I think it's it, it is a very interesting paper, and uh, and I wanted to to ask you uh, because how you 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 explained that actually these values were not like explicit, and now they are, and there are certain like uh, basic tenets of the EU law which were not there, but then the 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 the, the court just said that they are there. Mm -hmm. And uh, do you think that the same, same thing happened uh, when the, the court said that the EU has this constitutional identity, uh, which uh, it says that it is a legal order and then uh, it is basically uh, contains the um, uh, Article 2 values like uh, human rights pro uh, protection. Yeah. And democracy and and the rule of law so as as a as a maybe as a um i don't know uh, as a, as an answer or a response not to the constitutional identity review which uh, the german constitution did, basically the german uh, constitutional court did but what uh, hungary and actually poland is arguing that i'm not i don't really care and they don't they, they, they really don't care i don't want to do this so I, I am sovereign, I have my own identity, mm -hmm. so leave me alone because Article 4. And now the court is saying that, no, because Article 2, and I have my own identity. So do you, do you see here this, uh, the, the, I think that I want to ask about the role of the court in the European order as a kind of informal constitution making power, which is mm -hmm. like actually building up a more and more uh, united or, or integrated uh, entity. I mean, the court has played that role of, of uh, reluctantly first with rights, but certainly, you know, all the, whenever I teach EU constitutional, I say all the major constitutional doctrines were made up, you know, um, supremacy, direct effect, fundamental rights, and then now the rule of law. Um, the court introduced the idea of the rule of law long before you know, it, it was written into the treaties and so on. But um, the question is, uh, and lots of those have received subsequent political approval. 
ironically, the one that's gotten the most, the, the, the supremacy and direct effect remain only ambivalently politically approved, but fundamental rights, democracy, and the rule of law are written in core values, charter of rights, Article 6, Article 2, and so on. So there's no political reluctance to accept that constitutional move by the court. Much more reluctance about supremacy and direct effect, but the, yeah, they're kind of politically accepted, but they don't want to give the stamp of um, treaty approval. But um, has that made a difference? You know, because, um, you know, I think what's missing for me is, is a willingness to kind of put enforcement power behind them. That's what I see that, yeah, those values are written in. Now you can't say they're not, they're in article two, they're in article six, they're in article seven, they're in article 49, um, they're part of the system. Uh, however, um, you know, Poland and Hungary argued to the court in the rule of law conditionality case. Yeah, but it's, you know, they're for, it's, for, it's for states to fill out the meaning of those. You know, we say what the rule of law is and so on. And the court said, no, 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 uh, not true. They're, they're EU values, they're in article two. But the reality is the court can say that, but unless the member states stand behind and, and the court and say, yeah, this is what those values mean and you're not, then Poland and Hungary will win actually de facto because they, they're saying, yeah, we're in a liberal democracy, we're a democracy, it's kind of in a liberal one, yeah, it's fine, you know, and yeah, we, we protect rights, we just say what the rights are, you know, um, and, and yeah, we protect the rule of law, our rule of law. Um, so unless, you know, the, the, in this instance, I think the court needs the support of uh, the member states and the political institutions for that to, to hold, um, because, you know, otherwise it, it is, it's, oh yeah, the court's out there doing it, but, um, but they know they can get away with it, uh, you know, so we'll see how the conditionality works out. That could hurt if it's used properly. It's still linked to this, you know, budget, budgetary interests, financial interests of the EU, but it still could hurt, a bit too late for Hungary. Um, but, you know, so that's one. So I, I, you know, I still think that there's all these different kinds of mechanisms. Political pressure is one that's been missing all along. There's financial pressure that that bites, that might work if they can actually properly enforce it. And then what Aaron was saying, what you were saying is people, can, can we get people to care um, either in those states or in other member states? Do you want to be in the EU with uh, with the is that, that kind, is that what the EU is now? You know, um, you know we're ASEAN. We're just another you know we're a regional economic organization and can have all kinds of political systems. Or is it does it does it still is is it a um, an entity committed to democracy and the rule of law and and challenging illiberalism? Grania, do you think the in Russian invasion of Ukraine? is going to reinforce the sort of ability of Poland in particular to push back against any, um, any political action that would try to, it, it strikes me particularly just looking at the, the American relationship to Poland right now and the buildup and the uh, American troops the past month, what's happening it suggests that, you know, it, its geopolitical role is shifting in real time. And that's going to make it even more difficult for anything to happen along the lines that you would want to see, that we would all want to see in the EU. For sure. For sure. I mean, as soon as, as, soon as the major interests of an entity are threatened, there's immediate closing of ranks and, you know, you know, you said at the beginning, maybe people are distracted. I mean, no better distraction than war, you know, um, this is real. People are dying in real time and the EU security interests are fundamentally on the table. So, yeah, I'm sure that's right, that that Poland has has a, a big card now to play, um, you know. It doesn't mean I don't think it'll stop as you know the supranational institutions and so on. For now, um, you know, challenging Poland is difficult given um, how crucial they are in this um, in this security moment. On the other hand, you know, there's the other side, which is um, I wonder whether you know anyone in the EU is thinking might be a bit dangerous letting states like Hungary model themselves on. 
um, on Putin, you know, and, and, and allied themselves there. I wonder whether that's dangerous too. So it pulls in many different directions, but I think you're right that there's the immediate instant geopolitical security imperative of, um, you know, Poland has to be supported. Don't don't challenge them on this now. So it's it's a difficult and uh, horrible moment for Europe in all kinds of ways and for, and for more than Europe, you know, um, that's for sure. Yeah, so uh, thank you. I don't really want to, I think we are getting to the end, but I don't want to finish it with, uh, with this. So <laughs> um, I, I always thought that uh, the problem of the European Union with us, with Poland and Hungary, is, is, is because it is not a federal state, but it is something in between. We don't really know. It's supranational. It's, it's what? And so something in between. And and now I, I was listening to Erin, and then uh, if it were a federal state, we might end up with the same problem without actual solutions. So it's even better if they are just an in between, some entity, something. Uh, so it is, uh, it is, I think, and uh, obviously it will be an ongoing uh, discussion. Uh, hopefully we can, uh, in the future, near future, we can just deal with this and not, not the war and not all of those terrible things which are happening now in, in our neighbor. I'm right now in Hungary, actually. So uh, I'm really uh, concerned and, and uh, saddened about what is uh, happening. And But as I said, I don't want to finish this session with, with Ukraine and the war. So I really appreciate your presentation and uh, this discussion. I, I think uh, uh, that we, we've learned a lot and I really like the, this parallel between uh, the, EU, uh, the EU and the quasi-federalist constitutionalist entity. Thank you so much for your insight. And, um, um, and I, I hope that, uh, uh, that you also enjoy this session, even though we were just like among ourselves. But as I said, it is uh, recorded and will be available on our uh, YouTube channel, the, the YouTube channel of the graduate pro the program of the UFMG. So thank you so much and uh, have a nice, I don't even know, night, evening. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's night here already. Maybe it's evening there. So thank you and uh, good night, everybody. Thank you thank very you. much. Thank you very much. And thanks to Aaron too. Thank you, Rania. Bye. Bye. Thank you very much. Thank you. Team, uh, I have to see how to stop the the live transmission. Okay, thank you. I think I think you have to do this because it seems like you're the host. Let me let me see here. Yeah, 